Hey, I'm John Elefante, formerly of the group Kansas, and you're watching FaceTime with Todd Wharton. So I've been working in the restaurant industry for a pretty long time now, and I honestly thought I knew how to speak Spanish. But you know what? I really didn't. And there's a lot of people out there that speak Spanish that have no idea what the hell they're saying. So you know what? This segment right here is called No Habla. Hey, hola, primo. What? Primo, I don't speak Spanish. I'm Trinidadian. You dumb white boy. Hey, Diego. What did I say? Buenos nachos. We'll be right back with John Elefante. Welcome back to the show, everyone. So my guest tonight is a producer, writer, and singer, and he was known as the front man from the legendary group, Kansas. But you know what? Let's take a look at a clip. Please welcome to the show, John Alafante. John, how you doing, brother? I'm doing good, man. Thank you for having me, buddy. Yeah, man. Thank you for being on the show. Hey, before we get into it, I uh, was looking up your bio, bro, and you grew up in Levittown. Is that right? Yes, I did. That's uh, pretty crazy because I went to East Fennel High School, brother. Really? Yeah, well, man. I, I, I was fairly young when we moved out, man, but that uh, growing up in New York, man, it never leaves you. No, I mean, it's just, especially being Italian. <laughs> there you go. You're looking at one as well. I'm more of like a pizza bag. My father was like Jewish, German, Russian. My mother was the Italian in the family. So, <laughs> you know, we had the whole matzo pizza, Massapequa out there and the whole nine. So oh, my, my, uh, my godmother was from Massapequa. Yeah. Great, great area. I don't care what anybody says. Long Island has some of the best food that you can ever want. A lot of homemade restaurants. I love it out there. Oh, me too. We don't have any Italian restaurants in Nashville. We have some, <laughs> we have some that call themselves Italian, but it ain't Italian. You know, it's uh, maybe I mean, back Italian over there. There's fettuccine is like noodles this long. <laughs> My father, when he was alive, would see that go, what the, what, that is this? <laughs> And there's no gravy at all. It's just like, what, you guys don't do ragu? You don't do the tomato sauce out here? It's like, no, we uh, don't. Sorry. Yeah, we don't do that. Now, how did you do the gravy test? I mean, my mother used to put a piece of bread on the top of the gravy, and if it sunk, she would dump it out and remake it. How did you guys do it in your house? We did the taste test. The it always old, went? The good old taste test. You know, usually I... I'd have my wife, well, what she does is she fries up the meatballs and then she cooks them in the gravy. And then I taste the meatballs and I could taste the sauce at the same time. And I either gives a, I either give the thumbs up or she comes and gives me a backy. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me tell you something, man. Uh, your wife must be damn proud of you. First of all, congratulations on Kansas uh, legendary group. Everybody knows this band. Um, I still want to see him in a Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, uh, but we all know that's politics, and there's so many groups that belong in that. In that, I don't know who votes there's on so it. Many but, there's so many groups that don't belong there that are there. Yeah, <laughs> that's what that's what I don't get. Yeah, who's voting on all this stuff? That's what I want to know. Uh, I, think I don't know. They need to change that, but uh, let's I dive think, into. I, I, I love the way Dolly Parton took a stand and said, "I don't belong here." Yeah. <laughs> you know, she's she's a class act, man. 
Well, she's real. I just interviewed her producers of uh, Still Working 9 to 5, the creators of uh, the new film, the documentary based on her. Let me tell you something, man. She's a sweetheart. She really is. She's humble. She's one of those artists that no matter how big she is, she always keeps it level. And I think that's what Nashville, honestly, is all about, because a lot of the Nashville artists are just... I think they're just so humble on just being recognized. That country is being recognized worldwide. I think it's a struggle out there. But even with the rock groups, they're like for Kansas. You know, you're talking Pink Floyd. You know, you're talking anything in the rock realm. A lot yeah. of these bands were surprised because I spoke to Scott Page from Pink Floyd. How big a lot of your groups got. And honestly, when you create great music, really well written well sung and there's no studio sound and i know what you know what i'm talking about because a lot of your recordings a lot of times live it's a different type of vibe do you feel there's a different vibe going on today from back in the day yeah it's called a vocal tuner auto tune yeah that thing should have been sunk in the ocean long ago never to come back yeah, exactly. I can be the next Bruno Mars if you put that on my throat. I can dance, so why not? Let's do it. <laughs> and it made a lot of people famous that couldn't sing. Oh, yeah. Well, let's talk about somebody who can sing, which is you. Uh, you have a new album coming out, uh, which is a great album. Let's talk about that. The Amazing Grace, I believe. Yeah. And you cool. also have a new video, right, called uh, – uh, stronger now so let's talk about both of that today and the inspiration behind the album and also we, we, we've released another video called time machine one of the songs okay. of the record. great yeah yeah i think a lot of people are really rearing up and revving up to hear these uh great songs and videos so tell me the, let's let's get into it tell me the inspiration behind your album that you just threw out there you know what the record wasn't supposed to be made i mean it was i was out on the road and um all of a sudden, we started hearing about this pandemic, and I was I was doing a gig in Palm Desert, California. Yeah, and it was like you better get home, or you ain't gonna get a flight out. You know. Wow. So my wife was out there with me, and I'll never forget. It was March 9th. We said we better get home. Yeah. But to back up a little bit, there's there's a guy that had been sending me songs on my my uh, my, my Gmail account, and they were okay. It was like, okay. And he kept sending me songs, and they, each one got better and better and better. So to, to try and condense the whole story, I had a gig in, in Scottsdale, Arizona, with two days off before I had to go out to California before that March 9th day. Mm -hmm. He said, why don't you come to my studio, man? Let's see if we can come up with it. And I was like, eh, I, would, I just don't do that kind of thing, man. You know, right. But something made me do it. And uh, I'm, I, I went and met with him, and we... We didn't come up with any songs, but we came up with some really cool ideas. Right. And it started out as just an EP. We didn't know what we were going to do with it. Finally, we finished four or five songs. He said, hey, let's do a whole record. I said, dude, we don't have the budget to make a record. He goes, I'll pay for it. I said, you got to be kidding me. You know, I, I tried to talk him out of it, but he, he, he paid, he, he budgeted the record and, and paid for it. And, you know, we made it during the whole COVID era, but during the lockdown. Wow. Did you, uh, I mean, with all the scams and everything out there, when you first heard this, were you like, wait, what's going on here? Like, is this a fake thing? And do I got to throw this guy 500 bucks to withdraw $2 million so I can make the record? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? What was going on in your brain when you are? Well, you know what my, my wife said? She said to me, I quote, John. This is not like you. You would never go to a stranger's house like that. Right. And I said, the, the guy just feels harmless, man. It's like, I, you know, he put me up in a hotel for those two days, and I just didn't feel any threat. So got over to his house. And we came up with some really cool ideas, and, and I ended up really, really becoming great friends with this guy to wow. this day. That's a rare. And I, you know, rare, I asked him, why rare. do you want? I asked him, his name is Frank. I said, why do you want to do this, Frank? He goes, I've been waiting my whole life to do something like this because he's not a singer, you know, and he can, he could write some decent music, but he wanted somebody that was able to see it all the way through. Right. You know? Yeah. And, um, 
it, it, it turned out great. I mean, it, it's a really good record. Yeah, there are a lot of people out there that have incredible talent, but they don't know how to get to the person that can put them on that level that I think they need to be in. You know, this guy just showed his perseverance, and I'm sure he was a huge fan of yours, and he was probably very okay. genuine. And that's why I'm just like, wow, this is one of those rare, rare stories. I think every interview that you ever do you should always tell that story because every person is going to be like, really? Because I get calls about car warranties and emails about I got millions of dollars in a Nigerian bank account. and Oh, I get all that, that stuff. Everybody yep. does. I mean, but you get something where somebody genuinely wants to be like, hey, I want to make an album with you because I think you're the voice. Since, since, I, since I hit 60, I'm getting burial emails about where I should be buried. <laughs> I'm getting AARP stuff. I'm getting ED ads. Um, need I say more? <laughs> Everything that some old fart would, you know, be would be getting, I'm getting. <laughs> Next, I'm going to see you in like an icy hot commercial. Like, all right, it's over. Me and Shaq, yeah, just got to <laughs> rub it on your knee and you get paid for it. So let's do this together. Yeah, you know? my, my, my big toe flamed, inflamed on fire. <laughs> That's hilarious, man. Now, you have a new uh, video uh, out right now called Stronger Now. Right. Um, I listened to it briefly. Your publicist sent to me. You have a lot of old school styles to you, and which I kind of like. It's kind of like keeping the rock and roll alive. Is that something that you're looking to do in all your albums? Just keep what real rock and roll sounds like from back in the day, with the, obviously some of the elements of today. Um, I'm, I mean, melodic rock is in bed in my blood. It's it's in my blood. Mm -hmm. I love it, man. I mean, I I just love melodic rock. I love when songs aren't real predictable. I mean, you know, I'm, I don't think I'm going to have a huge hit single at this point in my life, but I mean, I know what my fans want to hear from me mm -hmm. and, but I change it up a little bit. I, you know, I, I mean, I've done five or six solo records and I mean, each one has been pretty successful, but I try to make everyone just a little different. You know, I, I, I don't like doing the same thing every time, mm -hmm. but I think there's a general thread that runs through what I do. That's, that's, that people like oh yeah i mean I, that's what a fan base is all about if you can keep fans for 30 40 years i mean that's that's a legendary legacy right there uh not a lot of people can say that that people actually would follow you that long and they just wait for new music to come out because that's what they want um when i'm, when I'm out on the road i i meet up with guys that have a stack of records that, you know like six inches tall and they want me to sign it all. And I remember when you did this and I remember when you did this, you know, the song on St. Almost Fire, the movie. And they had right. Really done. So people aren't sure about that song. Tell my fans right now, because I'm young and old, about that song that you did on St. Almost Fire, because I love that movie, by the way. It's one of my favorite. Oh, that's, the rap, that's the Rat Pack right there. Like the yeah, that, was, that, was, that was the beginning of the Rat Pack, man. We, we got a call from MCA. Because I was shopping my demo and they heard that song and got it to David Foster. And I got a call from David Foster and he said, man, this song's got to be on the record. It's perfect. Yeah. We met with David and we actually co-produced it with, with David. But the song was pretty much done. Um, me and Dave Amato from Mario Speedwagon did all the background vocals. And um, it was, I, I think, I think, I kind of think we got robbed a little bit because that song is a smash. Yeah. I don't know if you've heard Young and Innocent, man, but that song is a bonafide smash. Yeah, I'm but not that young, man. <laughs> the movie started to wane a little bit, and we never got to a third single. Wow. And we lost out on a Grammy to Beverly Hills Cop. <laughs> that goofy little soundtrack. Hey, I don't mean to laugh, but every time I hear somebody lose to something like that, I'm like, wait, you guys lost to Eddie Murphy? Like, what was it the song that he did? No, I'm just playing. Because Beverly Hills Cop, you know what it is? It's, again, it's politics. Your song was a better song, but it was because how big that movie became. Even though St. Almost Fire is a classic, like, hands down. I mean, Rob Lowe and all these guys, Charlie, all them, love it. But, yeah, that's just the way Hollywood is sometimes when it comes to soundtrack and music. Um, what was that? Beverly Hills Cop was in the dun, 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 
dun, dun, dun. what was it? Is it some yeah, it, little... it was some weird uh it was definitely Eddie Murphy and uh Judge Reinhold. And yeah. I forgot the theme song of it, but it was pretty popular. Uh well, the, movie was, the movie was very popular. Was it Billy Ocean that did that song? Maybe um, I'm wrong. I'm because it's in the same era. In, in, in St. Elmo's or Beverly Hills Cop? Beverly Hills Cop. I don't remember. I mean, I just remember a little goofy little synthesized thing. I don't remember any any songs with vocals in it. Oh, yeah. It okay. was just kind of all source music, it seems like. You know, you got to make me go back and watch it now. Be like, really? You guys lost to that? Yeah. <laughs> like, okay. Yeah, John Anderson from Yes was on St. Elmo's Fire. Yeah. Uh, you know, just a you know, John Parr. I mean, a lot of great singers, man. Oh, man. I mean, the soundtracks back in the... Let me tell you something. I have to say this. The soundtracks in the movies in the 80s, some of the best music I've ever heard. The collaborations from so many artists. Um, artists were dying to get on soundtracks. That was the thing to do. Like, when you were a hit, get on a soundtrack. Like, even when they did um, Judgment Night, when they combined, like, hip-hop and yeah. rock with anthrax, that was a huge album. And now, because of everything, streams and downloads, nobody yeah. even pays attention to the soundtracks anymore because nobody buys albums anymore. It's just very rare. You're right. You're right. You know, right. so you don't get the opportunity to be like, hey, you know what? Let me put this in while I'm doing my laundry and listen to this great soundtrack. No, you got to look for the song. You got to down. And it's just like, yeah, I know it's a new world, but. Do you remember Phil, Col- remember Phil Collins? I mean, it kind of. Yeah, he lifted his career back up when he did that. What was it the second Lion King or whatever? Yeah, I mean he's from Genesis originally as a drummer, and then moved on to a solo career. But his music, uh, what was that one song? I mean, it was just an incredible song that he did. It started out slow. I can hear you calling it in the air, right? I can hear you calling in, in the, the in the air tonight. Yeah, that's, that's, yes, that's in the air tonight. Yeah, but even with Kansas, and then you guys. You guys had that same vibe going on where it was just great music. You went to a concert. Every song was dope. You wanted an encore. Now you're lucky if you get a, an hour's worth of one artist that can actually perform. And uh, it's totally changed. Now, reverting back, was your family a huge influence on you growing up? Because I know you performed in your family band. Um, was that a big, big influence on you growing up throughout you know what? your years. My, my parents were not musicians. They were, were not in the music business by any means. But I told somebody earlier in an interview that I did that they used to play records 24-7. Frank Sinatra. Bossa Nova music. You know, New York was, because we were, my parents used to go, remember when, before Cuba was taken over by Castro? Yeah. My parents mm-hmm. used to go, it was like Las like Vegas was not- on the water. Yeah. You know, and they used to they used to go there, and they they come back with uh, you know Boston Over records, and they they listen to everything. Wow! I remember in 1965 and buying the like the first Beatles records, and they would play them 24 seven around the clock. And I I think that had a huge influence on me because another thing I said in an earlier interview today is I've I've never done anything I've never had a job outside of music. So that's pretty incredible. That's Nothing. really incredible. I mean, I always tell people, don't quit your day job until your night job can actually pay your bills. Yeah. And uh, I think it's a little different time today. Um, I think just everybody wants to be a celebrity. A lot of them don't have talent. And everybody wants a million dollars when nobody wants to work. Because I think me and you are from the blue collar era where there was no streaming. There was no internet. So working hard to get to the right people. I think that's what made you a better artist and a better businessman. Today, it's about, you know, trying to get to the right person. Um, yeah, are you exactly. are you finding um, younger audiences are coming to your shows now? Just yes. to hear what you're all about. I'm glad you asked that. Yes. There's been a resurgence of young people turning on the classic rock. Great. And I, you know, I got, I got to kind of attribute it to, uh, uh, what was it? Guitar, Guitar Hero. Oh yeah, guitar uh, hero. I'm horrible songs at were that. Full of, like you know, fog hat songs and Kansas and Journey and and I think kids were you know they were reintroduced to this songs that they'd never heard. Yeah, it's like what a cool song, man. Carry on, Wayward Son. I'll check this out, man. You know, walk this way. 
and you know, slow ride by Foghat. And it was like, oh, I've never heard this stuff. <laughs> Where'd it come from? Oh man, I love slow ride. The way it starts out, I mean, they had that in Gone in sixty seconds. It's just like, din, 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 din. oh man, ah, oh, those are just amazing songs. And I'm glad to see a younger audience. And I'll be honest with you, I think it'll be kind of cool. They do it once in a while, but um, I think like the Grammys and all that. I think they should bring you back on the show, even perform with so many newer. Because I'm noticing a lot more older groups are collaborating with the younger groups um, because some of these young guys are actually giving back to what they grew up on. And there's a cool synergy that happens during music. Plus, I honestly think when you do that, it bumps up your price value because not the millennials can actually get to know you and the music that you did and how important you were to the rock and roll era. That's hopefully, true. I would love to, hopefully somebody could be watching this and, uh, see what we're talking about i have a 20 year old son that uh, made me buy him a turntable and I, I could just kick myself for all the great records that i sold in garage sales 25 oh. years ago oh yeah you know what i mean i wish i had every one of them back because we got this really cool turntable in my media room and my son and i will we'll just spin records now they got the little scratches in them and stuff and the, you know all that stuff but they sound so great if you listen to a record and then a CD, it's like, ugh, get that off. Yeah. CDs are so compressed in such a small area. And yeah. the records are just huge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I completely agree. With that. I'm around DJs all the time. Uh, just And they always tell me uh, they love to work with LPs. You know what? LP shops are actually coming back. One just opened up a story here. right outside. Well, I'm, do I'm doing an LP on this record. And it's taken us seven months to get it done. Oh, serious? That's how that's how backed up they are. Yeah. And kids are going to be like, wait, I got to pick up something and, and do this. Like, isn't that a lot of work? I'm like, listen, lazy, just it's the same thing as scrolling. It takes the same amount of time. Just take your hand and move it over here and then listen. And you can hear the real sounds like you don't have to. Hear I, ha I have a, I have a friend that owns a company called Emotiva, which is a really, really exclusive high line audiophile that's all they sell their amplifiers are 10 grand their speakers are 20 grand their turntables are five grand so he's got a setup in his office that's probably 50 60 thousand dollars worth of stuff and he put on dark side of the moon i've never heard it like that in my life oh, dark side of the moon it's a classic album yeah, it's, i can't describe to you how good it sounded i mean I, my brother and i just looked at each other and went wow it's like they're set up in the room yeah and you can just hear every beat every tone every it's it's a little different now speaking of album go back to yours what was your top song on your album that you love to create to this day that you can't wait to play when you're on tour every time you know you're up there um you know kansas song or just anything your song your song one of my songs um well, one, it was it was actually on a Kansas record, but my brother and I wrote it. It's called Chasing Shadows. Right. Your brother Dino, correct? My brother Dino and I wrote it. A song called Chasing Shadows that was on a, I also think we got robbed because the song was a smash hit. It was the follow-up and not a replica of by any means, but it really was the follow-up to, to uh, Dust in the Wind. Wow. I mean, it sounded nothing like Dust in the Wind. Mm. But it had all the characteristics of a dust in the wind. Great melody, great lyric, great hook, you know, very thought provoking lyric. And it just, for some reason, it just never saw the light of day. Yeah. You can never tell when a hit song is a hit and when a dud song becomes a hit. Because the funny thing was, there's a story that, you know, Biz Marquis, when he uh, created that song, You, You Got What I Need. You know, yeah. just just a friend. He used to joke around where he's like, this is going to be a hit. And everybody's like, you out of your mind. This is the worst song ever. And before you know it, it was one of the biggest songs of all time. And you can't explain it, but we all know it. Um, it's one of those things where just because you like it as the person who wrote it doesn't mean the fans are going to relate the way you did. And uh, sometimes That's the true. fans predict your future. 
uh, whether you like it or not. Uh, that's what's having great fans for, because the fans are going to tell you what's good and what's not. And uh, well, I don't think Kansas ever thought Dustin the Wind was going to be a, a you know a classic a hit song. forever. Oh, I love that song. I great don't think song. they ever. I don't think you know when they recorded it, they didn't say like this is going to be the biggest single ever for Kansas. Because, you know, musically, it was nothing like anything else they did. Yeah. I mean, their number one song was Carry On Wayward Son. I mean, right. everybody knows that song. That song, you could still play that song today in movies. That's how great that song is. Um, Absolutely. How did, how did you miss now, uh, years later, knowing that you played in such a great band and you contributed to it? concert sold out how was that feeling now that you look back on your life even though your best part of your life is you're married with three kids beautiful wife great kids yeah. right <laughs> how was that come how was the comparison that you well, look you, back like wow you know that saying that they made when they stepped on the moon this is one giant step for man yeah giant leap for mankind yeah well joining kansas was the giant leap it was it was really the the thing that was the catapult for my whole career. Yeah, and and I always I always I always tell people because this this is really big to me. I was with the original band. Yep. I wasn't the original singer, of course. Right. But I was with all the original guys: Carrie, Dave, Rich, uh, Rob Steinhardt, um, Philly Hart, the drummer. Mm. I was with all the original guys in Kansas. And I was the last singer to ever perform with all the original guys. Right. All the iterations after that were all new guys, new bass player, new guitar player, uh, new keyboard player. And, you know, I mean, and the band's still going strong and they're still great, man. I mean, but just to be part of the original Kansas. Yeah. Was uh, that's that was big. That was really big. Of course. I mean, uh, people wait their whole lives to be a part of it. And I'm, and I'm sure like a lot of uh, most groups actually are not the originals anymore. And when a new singer comes in, you always hit with that animosity from people like, oh, he's not the original. Yeah. But you know what? It's somebody like him, like you. You're keeping that dream alive for fans. Right. And. I think that's what true fans realize. Like, hey, this guy's got an amazing voice. He's keeping our hopes alive. We want to see the whole band. And you know what? He's doing it. And you should be damn proud of that because I am. Not, not a lot of people can say that. Um, I think they did a movie with Mark Warburg, exactly your type of story. Um, Jennifer Aniston, I forgot what it was called. I think it was called Rockstar. It's pretty much about an artist who loved the group. You didn't know they were a tribute band. But he got to perform with the original group and became right. the lead singer of it. And I think that's every person's dream. Because to find a group that you're compatible with, that's very hard to do and then make it, right? Yes. But at least get that shot. Um, so kudos to you, Mac. Congratulations. I think that's awesome. Appreciate it. Yeah, of course. So what do you have coming up that a lot of people know about where you're going to be touring? Uh, you got to be here in New York. You got to come back to Levittown, man, perform okay or something like that. Oh, I come back. I come back from time to time. Yeah. Um, I don't have anything booked. I, upstate New York, I have some stuff booked. Actually, July 2nd, I'll be in um, Buffalo. Yeah, it's where my brother lives. Oh, yeah? <laughs> yeah. I was I up there for a year, even, man. I don't even know the venue yet. I just know I'm going to fly up. And I'm, uh, it's going to be me, the group Asia, and Blue Graham. Oh, that's great. So that'll be a fun one. I'm doing and, a lot of stuff like that. And that's great, man. So people want to follow your tour and everything. What's your name of your website so they can go on and uh, check it out? You can sign up for an email list if they want to. I would say uh, just go to my website, johnalafate.com. Okay, perfect. But the group that I'm that I'm touring with a lot is called Voices of Rock Radio. Mm -hmm. That uh, we all use the same band, and it's it's myself and a guy that was with Journey for a little while, uh, Randall Hall, that was with Leonard Skinnerd. Mm -hmm. We might use Charlie Hoon from Foghat or Mickey Thomas, or you know, it's it's kind of a 
it's it's kind of just a free for all of major you know main artists three or four of them they all use the same band and as opposed to one band going out when they only had a couple singles and all the rest of the stuff it's like i've never heard any of this Mm -hmm. you get to hear hits all night long oh yeah it's, it's it's wildly successful especially in the corporate arena which a lot of bands just love because i mean they pay so well yeah and uh they're Pretty easy gigs, but uh, a lot. I do a lot of corporate shows, a lot of them. Oh yeah, I mean, you know, listen. A lot of these corporations now, because remember when we were kids, we were listening to you. Now that we own corporations, like you know what? I want to bring back some of those groups that I grew up listening to. That what they're doing. I miss paying twenty bucks to go see because I don't want to spend two hundred. If I'm going to spend that type of money, let me bump it up to another couple of grand. Let me get the band up here to do a couple of songs for me. Uh, yeah, exactly you know what though I, I gotta tell you though man um my voice is still very much intact I, I, for some reason i don't know why but it's i sing all the same stuff and i'll hit all the same notes i did back in the 80s hey you don't smoke do you no heck no you know i gotta ask that right because i'm saying that right now and i want people to hear that your voice is in tune because you probably take care of it too and you, I'm sure you go through vocal stuff before you go on stage. You got to keep it energized. Oh, yeah. I, I think a lot of people forget that. If you smoke or smoke weed or this, and then you no, do I don't, I don't smoke anything. It messes with your vocal cords instead of just keeping it healthy. Um, I'm glad. Well, you I, had, I had two years of operatic training, too. Yeah. Which severely helped me. It gained six notes on my range. Oh, wow. So... I at one point had to totally relearn to sing because I was singing all wrong. And I mean, look what's happening with John Bon Jovi now. Have you seen that? Uh, no, T- tell me about that. Oh, I he's having he's having, uh, he's having he's having some serious vocal trouble. Oh, I'm hitting that high note that he. Oh, used hitting to do? hitting any notes. So it's it's amazing to talk to you, bro. I know it's late. Uh, I know you're on your last hurrah, but brother. Thank you again for all the great music over the years. All right, man. And thank you for being a guest on Facebook. Hey, I, I appreciate it, my friend. It was a pleasure talking to you. You got it, brother. Have a great night. You too. God bless you, man. So, John, brother, it was a pleasure speaking with you tonight. I know you had a long day, but thank you for taking the time out and coming as a guest on FaceTime with Todd Warden. I think we learned a lot about you today. Congratulations on your new album, new videos coming out. And, of course, being the front man with such a great band, Kansas, who has stand the test of time in classic rock will always be here and will never die. We have to thank you and everybody else in the classic rock world for making that happen. Guys, I hope you enjoyed this interview with John. I know I did. But until next time, if you're not living a passionate life, the new life you live. Take care, guys. I'll see you soon. He is the most interesting man in the world. I'm not always on YouTube, but when I am, I make sure I'm subscribed to FaceTime with Todd Warner. Be thirsty, my friends.